Let's open up our Bibles tonight to 2 Kings. We'll be looking at chapter 18 tonight. And so I just kind of felt led to share uh, a little bit from 2 Kings chapter 18 tonight with you guys. So it's a blessing to be here. It's always a privilege to come and to share here with the body at Chino Valley. And I think the last time I was here was just a couple of weeks back on a Sunday night. And uh, I had shared with you guys that I always feel like I'm at home when I come here. It's, it's like a, the second family <laughs> apart from the body at Living Way. So. so what I want to do tonight is I want to kind of just <clears throat> take some time and share with you guys from what I believe the Lord has been showing me in a time of study in um, the study of the kings. And one of the things that I think is important as we kind of look at this is it kind of gives us a little bit of an understanding as to, you know, where we are in our own personal lives. And even more so, um, just a challenge and a call for us to, uh, to trust the Lord and to live for Him and to wait upon Him. And so tonight, that's what I hope I can do here as I share with you guys, just to encourage you guys in your faith, in your walk with the Lord. And uh, that's typically what we're to do when we minister the Word of God, is to just impart encouragement and, and to a degree, a little bit of challenge, you know, and that we kind of consider where we are, take inventory of our heart and kind of just say, okay, Lord, you know, here, here's my life and, and just uh, stretch me and do more uh, with me uh, all that would bring you glory and bring you honor and bring you praise. And so what I've been doing over a period of time is <clears throat> I've been studying the lives of, of, of the kings in First and Second Kings and have just been really just blown away um, by the sovereignty of God and just God's hand upon his people and all that God has done through the lives of these various kings as he clearly is just leading his people. When we come here to 2 Kings, we come to the tail end, really, of the time of the kings. And oftentimes, we kind of look at the Old Testament, and, I, and I'm like an Old Testament, like, uh, you know, buff. I like to read the Old Testament. That's just my thing. I love it. And uh, I actually teach through the Old Testament on Sunday mornings at our church. I, I just love it. And so one of the things I told the congregation just not too long ago is I says, you know, <clears throat> you guys are history students. I was just sitting in my devotions in the morning before my a Sunday morning message, and I just, I'm just i reading through all this, and I says, this is history. I says, you guys are coming on Sunday morning to hear history. Who does that? But it's the Word of God, so it's so encouraging. So I, I just want to kind of take you guys a little bit on that adventure also as we look here at 2 Kings. So let's go before the Lord in a word of prayer, and let's just ask the Lord to speak to us, to reveal Himself to us. So Father, we just come before you. And Lord, tonight we ask that you, God, would speak to us, that you would reveal to us more and more of who you are and what you desire for our lives. And Lord, I pray that as we, as we open up your word, I pray that we would open up our hearts. And so we want to hear from you. We want to know you more. So speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So <clears throat> Hezekiah. Hezekiah, when you look in Scripture, was probably one of the greatest kings of the southern kingdom. And when we kind of start talking about northern and southern kingdom, here's, here's the history side. I just got to throw it in there. When you're looking at the life of Hezekiah in chapter 18 in 2 Kings, we're, we're, the northern kingdom is already gone. And what I mean by that is, remember, when you look at the story of Solomon, you guys all know that, you know, Solomon was the son to, to David who took over after David had passed away. Remember that. And Solomon reigned for a period of time over the nation of Israel as a whole. Well, when Solomon died, the kingdom divided. And it was no longer Israel as a whole, but it was now the southern and northern kingdom. And remember that there in about, you know, chapters 10 and 11 and 12 of 1 Kings, you'll find where now the division of the kingdom started. And the reason why the kingdom was divided after Solomon's death was because that was the heart of the people. 
And remember that the Lord had spoke a word to a man by the name of Jeroboam. And Jeroboam actually was a servant to Solomon. He, he actually served Solomon. And he was a man who was known to be one who was in the position of, uh, of leadership in the army of Solomon. He was an advisor to Solomon. He was well respected. And the Lord had clearly told him that when Solomon died, that he would give him a portion of the children of Israel in that he would inherit about 10 of the tribes. And the Lord promised him a dynasty. And the only other person that God had promised that same type of dynasty to was David in 2 Samuel chapter 7. Well, we know that rather than trusting in the promises of the Lord, remember Jeroboam fled because Solomon was upset that the Lord had made this covenant with him. And so he started to look for him. Now, Solomon wasn't a fighter, okay? His dad was. Solomon wasn't. He was a lover. We know that, right? He had 6,000 wives, so they say. So anyways... He wasn't going to do nothing to Jeroboam. While well, Solomon's now off the scene, Rehoboam, Solomon's son, steps into power. That was a typical thing. The father would die, the son would come into power. And Jeroboam comes back, and he takes those ten tribes that the Lord said he would give him, and the kingdom's divided. And so now, as you start to read from that point on, you start to see now all the kings who ruled in the northern kingdom, which were the ones that were under Jeroboam at the time, and the southern kingdom, those who are the ones that stayed with Rehoboam. Now, you begin to see when Rehoboam died, another king came into power. When Jeroboam died, another king came into power. When you come to 2 Kings chapter 18, we've already went through multitudes of kings on both sides. Now, here's the thing. In the southern kingdom, majority, pretty much all the kings were good kings. There was a couple of them that were bad kings. But on the northern kingdom, every single one of them were bad kings. There was not one good king at all whatsoever. And so at this point in time, throughout this time of the kings, and remember that this was a period of time that, that God was kind of taking his people through. Because remember, before you know, they wanted a king. They, they demanded a king. And prior to, to them having kings, it was the time where they had judges. Remember that? And, and, and because, you know, this is how the Lord delegated this very thing. The first prophet Israel ever had was Samuel. And so Samuel was used by God to bring in the first king of Israel, and he did that with Saul. And so this was a time now where this time of the kings is kind of ending. So we have a long history that has already transpired. But here's what's interesting. The northern kingdom, as we know it in Scripture, from the time of 1 Kings chapter 12, has always been called Israel. The southern kingdom has always been called Judah. Well, what's interesting here is the, south, the northern kingdom is gone, completely gone. Remember when you look at you know, chapter 17, and you begin to read the entire chapter, you'll, you'll find out that, uh, that the northern kingdom has actually been wiped out. It, it has become what is known as an Assyrian province. One of the greatest empires apart from uh, Egypt in this day was the Assyrian empire. And I, and I have to give you all this history because it's very important, okay? You, you can't miss this. Now, even though they were in a time of kings and so on and so forth ruling them, the people of Israel on both sides, on the southern kingdom and northern kingdom, had one problem. And their problem was idols. And though the southern kingdom was predominantly known for the real worship, okay, for the real worship, what's interesting is that when you consider all of this, you find something that I think is so fascinating about this. And, and I'll get into that a little bit later. But... Here's what's happening, is that where the northern kingdom failed, they failed to truly keep their eyes on the Lord, which led to their captivity by the Assyrian Empire. And so right now in chapter 18, there's no more northern kingdom. And remember, when Jeroboam first became king, rather than causing the people to turn to the Lord... He caused the people to worship idols. And remember what he did was the people had to go to the southern kingdom because that's where the temple of the Lord was. And remember, according to the book of Leviticus, 
the Lord was very clear that there were three feasts, three times a year that the children of Israel had to go up and they had to offer up their worship and their sacrifices and so on and so forth. And what Jeroboam said was, he says, you know, if they go to the southern kingdom, if they go to Judah, they're going to like it there because that's where the temple of the Lord is. And they're going to want to worship there. And then they're going to come back and they're going to want to kill me. And they're going to hate me. Nobody ever told him that. But this is what he thought in his own mind. So he says, I'll make some altars for them to worship here. And he made two golden calves. One is far south in Bethel, right on the southern border before they'd get there up into Judah, into the southern kingdom. And the other one is far north in Dan. If you go to Israel today, you go to the reserve that is called Tel Dan, you still see Jeroboam's altar there today. And what he told the people was, listen, it's too much for you to go to Judah. It's too far for you to go. Here is your God who led you out of Egypt and worship here. And then he says the feasts and the Sabbaths, he created his own that rivaled what God had given to his people. What happened was at that time, some of the priests said, this guy's crazy. We're out of here. So some priests fled from the northern kingdom to the southern kingdom, and they remained in the southern kingdom and worshipped, the true worship, and all those that stayed in the northern kingdom were considered idolaters from that day forward, and they never got away from it, and that's what led to their captivity. So now that the northern kingdom is gone here in Hezekiah's day, and Hezekiah now is king in Judah, the Bible says in verse 1, chapter 18, your attention please, it says, Now it came to pass in the third year of Hoshea, the son of Elah, the king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Now here's what's interesting about all of this, guys. Listen. Idolatry wiped out the northern kingdom. Okay? The southern kingdom saw what idolatry can do. Any time they would look in the northern kingdom's direction, it was gone. The Assyrian army was on the border of the northern border right there by the southern, by the southern kingdom. And so here what they saw was this Assyrian empire there and their brethren gone, taken captive. The Bible says that when the Assyrian Empire came in, what they did was they removed the children of Israel. As a matter of fact, what they did was they took them out of there, and as they conquered the land, they made it a province of Assyria. Remember that one of the things they did when they captured it, they removed the people from there. As a matter of fact, as you read a little bit further, it begins to talk in verse 24 of chapter 17. It says, Then the king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, Kutha, Ava, Hamath, and from Sepravim, and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel. And that's a whole other message. Because remember, you know how it says there, Samaria? Now you guys are starting to get an understanding of the whole story with Jesus at the woman at the, at, at the well. You remember when she told Jesus, you a Jew, speaking to me as Samaritan, she made like a big issue about him even talking to her? Because remember, the Samaritan people didn't exist. Remember, Samaria was made the capital of the northern kingdom. The people of Samaria were not produced until the northern kingdom was taken captive. And so these Gentiles from Babylon and from Ava and from Hamath and from Sepravim intermingled with Jews that were in the northern kingdom and they produced a race of people that were called the Samaritans. That's why the Jews had such a disdain for them. And remember what she said? Well, our fathers say this is the place, this is the place of worship. And, and Jesus says, you worship what you do not know. I'm just going to blow your guys' mind and then I'll get back to the passage. <laughs> When you read in chapter 17, as you read a little bit further, remember they brought, listen, seven gods into the land of Israel, Assyria did, and made it an Assyrian empire. Remember the woman at the well? When Jesus went and stopped and stood with her, he made a big thing about it. When he was there, he even told the disciples, I, I have food that you don't know of. And he was talking about getting the gospel and taking it there to the people of Samaria and revival broke out, did it not? Why didn't revival break out before? There were too many idols. Assyria took over, seven of them to be exact. You guys ready for this? 
Remember when Jesus started talking to the woman and he says, go and get your husband. And she says, well, you know, I'm not married. He says, that is true. He says, you've been married five times and the one that you're living with now is not your husband. And we know the application many people throw in there, right? Well, Jesus was the seventh man that she came in contact with and so he made her complete. Get it? And now she was right in her mind because she came in contact with Jesus, the Savior of the world, the Mashiach of Israel, right? Remember that? But Jesus came and fulfilled because the woman was a picture of the entire people of Samaria who had given themselves in spiritual idolatry to various gods. And Jesus, in one encounter, wiped out all the seven false gods that were brought into the land. The picture is beautiful. Jesus brings revival. And revival is an act of the heart. And Hezekiah is the one who's going to bring revival to Judah. You see, Samaria is gone as we know it, just right here in history. And this is why it's so important to look at this. And guys, listen. Look at what Hezekiah does. His dad was a crazy man. As a matter of fact, when you read chapter 16 of 2 Kings, the Bible talks about his father. His father's name was Ahaz, and the Bible says there that Ahaz did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. As a matter of fact, it said Ahaz was the worst king that Judah had. There was none as worse as him. You know what else it says about Ahaz? Out of all the kings in Judah, Every single one of them, it says, and they did what was right in the sight of the Lord. You know what it says about Ahaz? And he did not do what was right in the sight of the Lord. And guess what it says? And he walked in the ways of the kings of the north. That means that he was an idolater. And remember, guys, he was very, very, very wicked man. Now, remember who his father was. He was a good guy, Jotham. And remember who Jotham's father was, Azariah, the man that we know by the name of Uzziah. Isaiah was a prophet in this day. He was prophesying. As a matter of fact, when you get in to the next chapter in chapter 19, you'll find for the first time Isaiah being mentioned for the first time, and there he had already been ministering for 40 years. But look what Hezekiah does. Hezekiah, probably, they're probably thinking, this guy's going to be just as bad as his dad. But the Bible says here in verse 2, he was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abby, or Abigail, the daughter of Zechariah. Look at verse 3, I love this. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father David had done. Now, notice that it calls his father David. And what it really means is that, you know, here Hezekiah is one of the descendants on the throne where David received a promise and a covenant from the Lord. Remember in 2 Samuel chapter 7, the Lord made this promise to David and said, If your descendants honor my word, keep my commandments, and walk in my ways, there will always be a descendant of yours on the throne. We know eventually that led to who? Jesus. Okay? So Hezekiah is on that same lineage. Now take note of this, guys, that I think it's so important. It's saying here that Hezekiah used David as an example rather than his father. David is the great example for the kings of Judah to follow. Now Hezekiah now has to do some things here that was probably different than any of the other kings. As you read all the kings in Judah, and you can do your own study, read through it, trust me, you will love it. If you like history, you'll love First and Second Kings. But see, when you read 2 Kings and you read the life of Hezekiah, notice that chapters 18, chapters 19, and chapter 20 are all dedicated to the life of Hezekiah. As a matter of fact, not only are these three chapters, but in 2 Chronicles, in chapter 29, 30, 31, and 32, are all dedicated to the life of Hezekiah. As a matter of fact, you'll find also in the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 36, 37, and 38, and 39, all focus on the life of Hezekiah. Isn't it interesting that we hardly hear much about Hezekiah, right? So as I start looking at these kings, I'm like, this guy, he's the man. 
Check it out. The Bible says here, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father David had done. He removed the high places and broke the sacred pillars and cut down wooden images and broken pieces, the bronze serpent that Moses had made. Wow, did you guys know that they were worshiping the bronze serpent that Moses had made? They had been worshiping it up until this point. You could put this in your notes and put it in, in your Bible for that matter. They had been worshiping this bronze serpent for 800 years. Now you get my point when I said Israel had a problem with idols, right? You remember when they came out of Egypt? Remember what Joshua told him? He says, throw your idols away. Joshua was now taking them into the promised land. Moses took him as far as he could take him, and Joshua says, listen, you guys came out of Egypt. You guys brought these idols. Throw these idols away. Take them out of your cupboards. And they were hiding them everywhere. And what they would do is when God wouldn't answer their prayer, they would right away resort to praying to these little idols. Now, let me give you guys just an idea, because when you look at the story of Hezekiah, I guess we can say the theme could be revival. But let me tell you something about revival. This is a word that's being thrown around today quite a bit. And, and here's the thing. I'm not no uh, expert on revival. But what I do know is that revival is an act of the heart. You can't create revival. There is no emotional type of thing that you can do that can stir revival. Revival starts in an individual's heart. And as a matter of fact, when you consider revival, remember the word revival means to bring back to life that which is dead or that which has stopped growing. Now, I don't know about you guys. We're so focused on, oh, I'm waiting for the revival of the last days. What are you talking about? As if this is just going to happen out of nowhere. Revival starts with you. It starts with me. It starts with our own heart. You see, the Bible says very clearly here, if we kind of consider all of this, guys, look, there are three things that produce revival in the heart of the individual. The northern kingdom didn't want revival. They wanted idols. Now they're gone. Hezekiah has a different perspective. Three things need to take place. You ready for this? Jot it down if you're taking notes. The first thing that needs to happen for revival is you have to have the right heart. Revival is an act of the heart. Jot that down. You have to have the right heart. The second thing you need to have is you have to have the right worship. You see, when you read about worship in the scriptures, it's not this 20 to 30 minute set that takes place before the Bible study starts on Sundays and Wednesdays. That's a part of it. But worship is a lifestyle. How you live on a day-to-day -day shows who you worship. Worship is a lifestyle. So you have to have the right worship. Here's the third thing. Third thing for revival to start, guys, listen, you have to have the right God. You see, they worshiped a lot of gods. Oh, they pray to all kinds of gods. And listen, there is no other God except the Lord God. I mean, obviously, that's what the Shema is, right? Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God. The Lord your God is one. Of course, there is no other God beside him. And all these gods in Scripture, all these gods that we read about, the, the, the gods of, of various foreign kings and lands, guys, listen, these were all just ideologies in the minds of the people. They were only as strong as the people made them in their mind. They never existed. There's not this, you know, bunch of gods in the heavens there, and they're all battling it out, and God wiped them all out. No, none of them exist. It's only God and God alone. But anything that we Exalt higher than Christ in our life becomes your God. And notice something here. If you don't have the right heart, the right worship, the right God, you'll never see revival. Some of us, perhaps tonight, I don't know, but maybe I'll say this in general, the body of Christ. There are some in the body of Christ that need revival in their walk with the Lord because it's dead. They need revival in their devotional life because it's dead, it stopped growing. They need revival in prayer. They need revival in the Word. For some, they need revival in their marriage. 
You see, guys, listen, we can go to conference after conference and retreat after retreat. I'm not opposed to any of those. I encourage our body to go and get involved because I do too. But those are not the things that bring revival. Revival is an act of the heart. You know what Hezekiah did that his father didn't do? Hezekiah did what was right in the sight of the Lord. That's what it says in verse 3. Jot this down in your notes. The first thing that Hezekiah did in order for revival to take place in Judah, after seeing the demise of the northern kingdom, what he did was he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. That's what he did. Notice that it says that there. And then the Bible says here, he removed the high places and broke the sacred pillars and cut down the wooden image and broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. The second thing he did was he removed the high places. He removed the altars and the idols. You want revival? What are the things that could be idols or altars in your life? What are the things that perhaps maybe the Lord has been putting his finger on and saying, listen, this has to stop. Sometimes God makes us aware of the things that we're putting a little bit more attention on that he's not getting. But you see, Hezekiah knew in his heart what would bring revival. Now, check this out, guys. The Bible right away jumps into verse 5, and it says, He trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor who were before him. But let me kind of read something to you guys. I just want to give you guys, I, I, think, I, I think you guys will appreciate this. Let me read to you guys what happened in verse 4, okay? Remember I told you from Second Chronicles, when you start to read the life of Hezekiah in chapters 29 and 30 and 31 and 32, you get more detail as to what he did. I'm going to read to you everything that should be in verse 4 and after. You ready for this? Okay, listen to this. The Bible says this. Then King Hezekiah rose up early, gathered the rulers of the city, went up to the house of the Lord, and brought seven bulls, seven rams. This is what he did in verse 4. I, you know, when you read uh, verse uh, chapter 29, and you go from verses 3 all the way down to, uh, you know, verse 19, it's just pretty much what he was doing in verse 4. But check this out. Remember what his dad did. His dad closed the doors to the temple. And he paid tribute to the king of Assyria. Hezekiah just opened the doors of the temple. And the Bible says here that he gathered all the house and they brought seven bulls, seven rams, seven lambs, male goats for a sin offering for the kingdom, for the sanctuary, and for Judah. Then he commanded the priests, the sons of Aaron, to offer them on the altar of the Lord. So they killed the bulls and the priests received the blood and this sprinkled it on the altar. Likewise, they killed the rams and sprinkled the blood on the altar. They also killed the lambs and sprinkled the blood on the altar. Then they brought out the male goats for the sin offering before the king and the assembly, and they laid their hands hands on them and the priests killed them and they presented their blood on the altar as a sin offering to make atonement for all Israel. Notice that it says Israel now. Because it became one now after the northern kingdom was wiped out. Remember there were those from the northern kingdom that came at the start of idolatry happening there. This is now the remnant that is spoken about in scripture because the southern kingdom is the only one that's left. And look at what happens here. It says here, they made atonement for all of Israel. For the king commanded that they, the burnt offering, the sin offering, be made for all Israel. And he stationed the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals and with stringed instruments and with harps, according to the com uh, commandment of David, of Gad, the king's seer, and Nathan, the prophet. For thus was the commandment of the Lord by his prophets. The Levites stood with instruments of David and the priests of the trumpet. Then Hezekiah commanded them to offer burnt offerings on the altar. And when the burnt offering began, the song of the Lord also began with the trumpet and with instruments of King David, King of Israel. All the assembly worshiped, the singers sang, the trumpeteers sounded. All this continued until the burnt offering was finished. Guys, listen, the people begin to worship the Lord and he gathered all the leaders and got everybody in one accord. Now listen, guys, here's what's so amazing about this. The reason why the people were able to come and worship this way was because, listen, the distraction was moved out the way. They never worshiped like this before because the people found comfort in the altars and the high places 
that existed before Hezekiah became king. Hezekiah becomes king, wipes them out, and says, listen, we need to go to the house of the Lord and we need to worship. And what he's doing now is he's teaching them, here is the right worship. This is how we're to worship the Lord God of Israel. And he restored the worship of the Lord there. And what began to happen was, guys, the people, as you read further on in the chapter, were so blessed. And then what did he do? He took it a step further. You know what he did? He began to invite all the surrounding people in Judah and said, listen, you guys should all get on board with this. As a matter of fact, the Bible says in chapter 30 here in 2 Chronicles that he sent letters out to all those in Ephraim and Manasseh that they should come up to the house of the Lord to Jerusalem. Listen, to keep the Passover of the Lord God of Israel. Now, here's what's interesting. Look at what Hezekiah is doing. You guys will see why we're reading so much. Listen, in verse 6 of chapter 30, it says, Then the runners went throughout all Israel and Judah, and with letters from the kings and his leaders, and spoke according to the command of the king, children of Israel, return to the Lord God of Israel, or Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Then he will return to the remnant of you who have escaped from the hand of the kings of Assyria. And do not be like your fathers and your brethren who trespassed against the Lord God of their fathers, so that he gave them up to desolation as you see. Now do not be stiff-necked as your fathers were, but yield yourselves to the Lord and enter his sanctuary, which he has sanctified forever, and serve the Lord your God with the fierceness of it, that the fierceness of his wrath may turn away from you. For if you return to the Lord, your brethren, your children will be treated with compassion by those who lead them captive so that they may come back to this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful and will not turn his face from you if you return to him. Notice that. This was Hezekiah's address to all those as he's addressing them. And what is he saying? Let's come to a time of repentance. Let's turn back to the Lord. The altars are gone. The high places are gone. The doors in the temple are open. The Levites are back in there and they're offering up the worship and they're offering up the sacrifices and the blood of the sacrifice has hit the altars once again. And all he's doing is he's saying, guys, it's time to come back. The distractions are gone. So what are you going to do? The sad thing is some rejected. But here's a good thing. Listen to this. The Bible says in verse 23 of the same chapter that we were just in, it says, Then the whole assembly agreed to keep the feast another seven days, and they kept it another seven days with gladness. That means that the time of their feasting had come to finish. And when they came to stop, the people said, We don't want to stop. We want to continue. Now, as you read chapters 29 and 30, you'll find out three things happened. Pretty amazing. Notice that nobody here of the leaders of Israel or Judah, for that matter, rejected. They obeyed. Every single one of them obeyed. When revival is an act of the heart, obedience is never an issue. You obey. It's never an issue. You know what else is amazing when you read these two chapters here in 2 Chronicles? The people had no problem giving. When revival is an act of the heart, giving is never an issue. Now, I'm not talking about tithes and offerings. <laughs> oh, no, here he goes, talking about money. <laughs> it's not being set up. You know, you're like, they didn't pick up offering yet. What's he going to do? You know, no, don't worry about that. <laughs> But it's not only tithes and offerings. I think we get this all the way we've, the way we've messed things up. You know, it's like we think when we talk about giving in the, in, in the church, right away people think money, but we're talking about giving of ourselves. There was no problem. None whatsoever. Third thing we see here is that the people wanted to worship longer, and guess what? Their worship extended seven days more. When revival is an act of the heart, worship is never an issue. 
You know, today we live in such a time where everything becomes so, you know, get in, get out, you know, and, and, and you know, and we got to do it like that. If not, you're going you're gonna to lose people. You know, it's like, what happened? What happened to the church? What happened to the people that just wanted to sit at the feet of Jesus? Hezekiah is saying, guys, listen, when revival is an act of the heart, when you have the right heart, the right worship, the right God, obedience is never an issue. Giving is never an issue. Worshiping is never an issue. We just do it. Because our hearts are so consumed with the living God. Now look at this for a moment. All that just happened in verse 4. Let's go back to chapter 18 of 2 Kings. That's pretty crazy, huh? This, it is. Trust me. I get all into this stuff, man. But you see, when I'm reading this, I'm just like, man, this is crazy. And then I'm like, the, 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 look at here. It says here that he removed the serpent that Moses, that, that blew me away. I said, what a, how is that thing still around? Yeah, I thought that was done with. You know, I went back to the book of Numbers, and I'm looking at that story, and I'm just like, it never said that they held on to it. I was blown away by that. I'm like, them people are crazy. But isn't it interesting how they took that which was supposed to bless them and they made it an idol? That was an interesting thing for me as I stopped and I says, how many things do we say is of the Lord and it really isn't? It's become an idol in our life and we've been worshiping it our entire Christian walk. That's why there's no breakthrough. I don't understand how people walk away. I don't understand how you could stop reading your word. I don't understand how you could stop praying. I don't understand how fellowship and going to church is like, oh, you know, we got to go to church again. It's like, you know, guys, listen, what happened? They started worshiping this thing. You remember what Jesus said? Really, the whole purpose was it? Remember when he said in John chapter 5, he says, you know, just like the serpent that Moses lifted up. He says, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. That was the whole picture of it. They were, they were complaining. Remember that? Uh, you know, and the next thing you know, and they're complaining. All of a sudden, these snakes, they started getting them. I was like, oh, Lord, you did it. <laughs> you, 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 you did good back then. You know, it's like they couldn't get away with anything. And the next thing you know, when they realized these serpents are of the Lord, they started to cry out to the Lord. You know, Moses is like, oh, man, you know, they're getting bit left and right, you know. And the Lord says, make a serpent. Make a bronze serpent. You see, bronze is the metal of judgment. And what did he say? Make it of the evil that's attacking them. So when evil is judged, you will be saved. And that's why when they looked upon the evil being judged, they were spared in the book of Numbers. And Jesus said, if I be lifted up, him being lifted up was evil being judged, and now we are saved. That was the whole picture of it. Very simple. But they were like, oh, we got to worship this thing. Oh, we got to bow down. I don't know what type of noise they made, maybe hissing, I don't know, like a snake. I don't know what they did. But either way, they worshiped it, and they treated it and revered it as a god, and they took the very thing that gave them life and corrupted it. And so the Bible says here that he removed the altars and he removed the idols. Look at verse 5 very quickly. He trusted in the Lord God of Israel so that after him was none like him among all the kings. The third thing that Hezekiah did was he trusted in the Lord. Notice that. He trusted in the Lord. Hezekiah had a right heart, remember? It says he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. He had a right heart. Hezekiah removed the altars and the idols. Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, and the Bible says there was no other king like him. Look at verse 6. For he held fast to the Lord, he did not depart from following the Lord. What was it that Hezekiah followed? Notice what it says here, but kept his commandments, which the Lord commanded Moses. What did he hold fast to? The word of God. He had a right heart. He removed the altars and the idols. 
He trusted in the Lord and he held fast to the Lord, the word of the Lord. Notice that. And then the fifth thing that Hezekiah did, look at what it says in verse 7. Then the Lord was with him. He prospered wherever he went. Hezekiah prospered. Let, let me kind of give you guys a, you know, because there's not enough time, but just, you know, I can, I can just go for days and break this thing down. But check this out. Look at what it says here in this verse. You guys are going to like this. I know you will. You guys are students of the word. I know you guys got a great pastor, great Bible teacher. The Lord was with him. Listen, he prospered wherever he went and he rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him. You know, that's interesting. Because in, you know, just as we read a little bit further, he's going to reach out to the king of Assyria and say, I'm sorry, I sinned against you. Tell me what I need to pay you and I'll pay you. That was one of the weaknesses in Hezekiah's ministry. But when it says here that he rebelled, remember that his father, Ahaz, paid tribute. He became a tributary to the king of Assyria and began to pay money to him. And remember, he took all the gold and the silver from the house of the Lord and gave it to the king of Assyria. And he made Judah a vassal to Assyria. They became subject to him. Well, when Hezekiah came and he removed the altars and all this, and when payday came for Assyria, Hezekiah was, I ain't giving you nothing. And the Bible says that he prospered. Judah had some very difficult days. They had the Assyrian Empire on their border already crossing over. And remember, as you read a little bit further, you're going to see that Assyria had already started to conquer some of the cities in Judah. They were already making their way across. And it blows my mind with the Assyrian Empire on his heels. Listen, a very large empire that he just saw wipe out the entire northern kingdom. And some of the people rejecting as the letter went out, no, we're not, we're not going to go. Listen, here's what's interesting. Hezekiah was not moved by his circumstances. He prospered. So when someone says, well, you know, I'm not growing because of him or because of her. I'm not growing because of them. That's not biblical. If a man can prosper on a day like this, trust me, you can prosper anywhere if you're in the Lord. Nothing or no one should get in the way of your growth in the Lord. You know that? I can only blame my lack of growth on me. Hezekiah was not moved by the circumstances around him. I love that. And look at he prospered. And I love verse 8. Check this out. He subdued the Philistines as far as Gaza and its territory from watchtower to fortified city. Hezekiah was a victor. Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, guys. That's what he did. And God prospered him. And the battles that he fought, he won. You, you know, here, just kind of, let's kind of just revisit this here, guys. Listen. First thing that he did, he did what? He did what was right in the sight of the Lord. He had the right heart, correct? Second thing that we saw Hezekiah do was he removed the altars and the idols. That's what you're going to do immediately if your heart is right with the Lord. You're going to stop sinning. You're going to stop doing the things that separate you from the Lord. And some people tell me, how do I stop sinning? I tell them, fall in love with Jesus. Because you're not in love with him. When you love him, you will not associate yourself with the things that hurt him. He removed the altars and the idols. Third thing he did was he trusted in the Lord. Amen? Fourth thing he did was he held fast to the word of the Lord. The fifth thing he did was he prospered. And the sixth thing he did was he was a victor everywhere he went. Guys, check this out. I just got to throw this in there because it's kind of cool, okay? See, Gaza here, guys, listen, was the southernmost city of the Philistines. What does that have to do with anything? It has a lot to do with Hezekiah in revival breaking out in Judah because when revival is an act of the heart, you'll always get the enemy's attention. This city, Gaza, here was right on the border where the Assyrian Empire was. And guess what? After verse 8, you're going to begin to see as you read further, now Assyria crosses over the northern border and comes into the southern border and starts wiping out cities left and right. Whenever revival is an act of the heart, it will always be tested. 
But Hezekiah stands his ground, resorts to prayer, and he seeks the Lord, and God delivers him. God delivers him. There's more to this message that I know would bless you guys, but just consider this. Acknowledging in your heart tonight, I need revival. Revival is not something you can create. It's an act of the heart. It's an act of the heart. Is my heart doing what is right in the sight of the Lord? And if it is, you'll know. Because you're disassociating yourself with the things that break the heart of the Lord. But there are so many things that get in the way for our lives to experience this revival that God so desires for us to experience. No, revival is not something that happens in a church service down the street. Revival is an act of the heart. And when your heart is ready to receive, revival, trust me, everything around you, it's like some people say, I feel like I got saved all over again. That's because they're experiencing revival. I don't know about you guys, but I desire that more than anything. I desire revival. And you know what? When I was studying this and I was reading, I was like, man, Lord, this is crazy. All kinds of stuff. I was like, man, this is good. And then I said, Lord, I want this. And it's like I heard the Lord tell me, you want that? Yes. Then I want your heart. All of it. You see, guys, listen. People get excited about Jesus when your life is excited about Jesus. There's too many Christians, you know, like, oh, you know, just, you know what I'm talking about? Like, man. <laughs> I need some of them. It's like, oh, they're a believer. Oh, okay, cool. And then when you get to talking to them, it's like, all they're doing is complaining. And, you know, I hate my job. I hate my life. I hate my wife. I hate my kids. It's like, and I'm just looking at them like, are you, what's going on with you? You know, you know, and then it's like, you know, and I just, I love the Lord. And, you know, I'm reading this and I'm just like, this doesn't make sense, man. How could you hate all these? And you look, what are you talking about? You don't know the Lord. If you're talking like that. Something happened. And it wasn't that God lost his power. Or that the spirit is not at work. It's that perhaps maybe you become like those who have consumed themselves with too many idols. And they don't know who they're serving. But I'll tell you what. Christ is all we need. Tonight, that's it. That's all we have to do is just say, Lord, you know, you know that old school song, Heart of Worship? That's a classic, man. But that is the truth, an act of the heart. God's desire for you and I, guys, listen, is for us not to get caught up with things that separate us from him. His desire is to prosper you, is to bless you. We have a lot of older people in our fellowship and and, and uh, you know, mature uh, believers. We call the seniors ministry the seasoned saints. They're seasoned and they're saints. And it's like, hey, you know, they're cool, man. I don't like to say old because I always get, you know, told something after service. Anyways, <laughs> the older crowd, you know, the more mature crowd. But, you know, I'm always blessed by them. But then I go up to them and I tell them, listen, And I ask this question, I tell them, where, where do you feel you stopped growing? And every single one of them tells me in everything. Just because I've been walking with the Lord longer than you've been alive, Pastor Dave, doesn't mean that I don't stop growing and I don't struggle with things and I don't wrestle with things. You know how humiliating that is? It humbles me. It's like, man, I'm thinking like, I got to go on this long, Lord? You know, just... But what that shows me is this, is that God desires to continue to grow us and mature us and bring us to that place because you wanna know what? None of us sitting here tonight have been perfected. That day will come according to 1 John chapter 3, verse two, where it says, we don't know what we are becoming, but when we behold him, we know we're going to be just like him. That hasn't happened for any of us but it's a day that all of us are looking to.
Amen. How many of you tonight would be honest in your heart and say, you know what? I desire revival. I want revival. I need revival. Lord, I need it in my devotion. I need it in my prayer. I need it in my walk. I need it in my life. Lord, I got to come back to that place. And trust me, revival is an act of the heart. And guys, it ain't going to happen because we've had some exciting service. It's going to happen when you set your heart to do what is right before the Lord like Hezekiah did. And you remove those things that have been hindering revival in your life. And then you begin to trust in the Lord in areas that you stop trusting him for, and then you begin to hold fast to the word of God and not the wisdom of man. And you'll begin to prosper. And any battle that comes your way, you will be the victor. I don't know about you, but every time I hear the word revival, I think to myself, Lord, I want that heart. I need it. If that's you tonight, I'm just going to ask you a simple question. Not bowing head, raising, you know, I just want you, hey, Pastor Dave, that's me. I want you just to stand to your feet. I want to pray with you tonight, if that's you. Anybody in this place? And if you're sitting there and you feel that tugging at your heart, that's the Holy Spirit. And he's saying, you better get it now. Listen, guys, there are many things that can consume our life. Many things. Like Hezekiah, man. You guys go home, take the time to read the story of Hezekiah. You're going to be blown away with this guy. And when the enemy try to challenge, listen, now you guys walk away. This is the thing. I, I talked about this some time back, and I, I, you know, and I says, you know, now the revival is going to be challenged. It always happens. Hezekiah became discouraged. And Assyria sent a commander to speak to him, and he told him, your God is not going to help you. He started to tell the people in Judah, don't listen to Hezekiah. He's going to send you to hell. He's going to ruin you. You're going to die. Your God is not going to deliver you. You know what he started to say? What about all these other people and all these other kingdoms that Assyria wiped out? Where are their gods? Did their gods deliver them? No, and your God is not going to deliver you either. And I love what Isaiah said. Oh, my goodness. This is what he said. He said this in chapter 19. I love this part here. I love what, look at what he says. So the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah, and Isaiah said to them, Thus you shall say to your master, Thus says the Lord, Do not be afraid. I love this. Look at the next couple of words. Do not be afraid of the words which you have heard. You know what he's saying? They're just words. Why are you afraid of words? They're just words. You know the thing that takes us out so many times? Our words. Somebody needs to hear this tonight. They're just words. Don't let that be the thing that gets in the way of what God is doing in your life.